Hello everyone and welcome again. So continuing our discussion about the orthopedics trauma basic principles class. Here we will talk about the x-ray radiographs interpretation in orthopedic trauma. So in this video we will go over the basics of x-ray interpretation and we will talk about some facts in the beginning then we'll tell you what to look for in an x-ray radiograph so what to look exactly at when you have the x-ray and then we will talk about the fracture description and finally we will talk about the rule of twos in the trauma x-rays so let's start so let's start with some facts so the x-ray is the first line investigation to look for fractures and joint injuries in orthopedic trauma and different tissues of a human body have different densities and the higher the density the more radio opaque white the more white it appears on the x-ray film and the lesser the density the more radiolucent which is the black appears on x-ray so every tissue and every uh, content of the human body have different density so the fluid uh, is from 0 to 15 uh, 0 being the most radiolucent so the most black and 1000 being the most radio opaque meaning the, the, the most white of the x-ray so the fluid would be from 0 to 15 the soft tissue is slightly higher 20 to 40 then the blood is from 50 to 80 and the calcification is 90 plus and the bone is 200 plus and if there is a metallic object it would be 1000 plus so what to look for in an x-ray so you start with the bones then you go to the joints and you finally look at the soft tissue so let's start with the bones so step one is that you look at the anatomy of the bone and you see if it is normal and follow the cortex of the bone looking for cracks example would be the shoulder radiograph you look for the anatomy first are the humerus scapula clavicle bones in their normal positions and then you follow the cortex as we mentioned so this is here an example of an x-ray radiograph so as we mentioned you make sure that the bones are their normal anatomical position uh, and as we can see here that the they are in their normal positions the clavicle the humerus and the scapula and then you look for any cracks in the bones following the cortex of the bones so you start uh, if you see the fracture first then you start with the fracture and then you look elsewhere but if you didn't see it then you start with the humerus looking for any cracks and you follow it with a pen and with experience you will not need a pen and you will be much faster but in the beginning uh, try to do it with a pen just to train your eyes so the clavicle here you make sure that there is no fractures in the clavicle and same goes for the scapula you look for the acromion and the coracoid and you uh, you finish the scapula here looking for any cracks and then you come here to the glenoid and it all looks normal there is no cracks whatsoever and you also look at the lung looking if the lung is shrinked indicating pneumothorax and in this example the lung is normal this is here another example but this time with a clavicular fracture so the clavicle is fractured here with displacement so uh, this is very obvious but you also look for any fractures in the humerus and in the glenoid in the acromion in the coracoid or in the scapula and all of them are normal and you also again look for the ribs and the lung so after you finish the step one you come to the step two which is the general appearance of the bone you look for the density of the bone and is, is it low density or high density low density indicate osteopenia or osteoporosis 
high density indicate osteosclerosis. And if there is any abnormal trabeculation, maybe in budget disease. So here we have an example of an osteoporotic pelvis in comparison with a normal pelvis. So as you can see, the density of the bones here, uh, of the pelvis and the uh, hips are, uh, are decreased in comparison with the normal one here. Uh, so yeah, it would give you an idea that there is maybe osteopenia or osteoporosis, but remember that the uh, precise investigation to look for osteoporosis is the DEXA scan. In step three, you look for any lesions in the bone, and if there is any, then focus on a number of things. So first, you focus on the location of the lesion. Is it medullary? In the medullary part of the bone, is it in the endosteal, in the cortical, or the periosteal part of the bone? And you look for the margins of the lesion. Is it well-defined margin, or means non-aggressive pathology, and or it has an ill-defined margin in aggressive pathology. And you also look for the morphology of the lesion. Is it circular, ovoid, etc. And then you look at the lesion matrix. It could be a lytic lesion in multiple myeloma and metastasis, and it could be fibros fibrous lesion, which appears as a ground glass on the X-ray and occur in fibrous dysplasia. And it could be a cumulus cloud in osteoid lesions or popcorn in cartilaginous, cartilaginous lesions. And it could be a cell properly in cystic lesions. And you look for the periosteal reaction to the lesion. The periosteal reaction is the reaction of the periosteum to the irritation caused by the lesion. It could be a smooth reaction or benign reaction in benign lesions, or it could be laminated in moderately growing lesions. It could be hair on end in fastly growing lesions, and it could be Codeman triangles in rapid rate of growth of a lesion. And you look for extra osseous or soft tissue involvement of the lesion. And here we have an examples of bone lesions. So in the left picture here, we have uh, a lesion in the uh, proximal phalange of the index finger, and it has a well-defined margin, as we can see here. And with cortical thinning, there is thinning of the cortex, and it's also associated with a fracture here. And uh, it has some calcifications here, and this is all characteristic of an inchondroma of the index finger. Uh, and here on the right, we have another example of a lesion in the proximal part of the humerus. It also has uh, well-defined margins, as we can see here, and it associated with a fracture right here with falling fragments, as we can see here. And it's also associated with cortical thinning. The cortex of the bone is thinned down uh, and it is cystic looking lesion. And this is all characteristic of juvenile or simple bone cyst. In this example, we can see that uh, there is a lesion in the uh, fem femoral, in the shaft of the femur, and uh, it has an ill-defined margins as we can see here, and this is uh, multiple uh, x-rays for the same lesion, but at different times. Uh, and as we can see that there is uh, the cortical density on this side is less than the other side, and with time it is getting less and less, which finally led to a fracture, as we can see here. Uh, and this patient has a breast cancer, which metastasized to uh, the femoral bone here, so yeah. So after you assess the bones on the x-ray, now you assess the joints. So the articular cartilage is radiolucent on x-ray. That's why the joint space is radiolucent because it is occupied by the articular cartilage. Uh, and because it is uh, radiolucent, mean it, it is black, 
uh, when it appears as black, you might think that it is empty, but uh, in fact, it is occupied by the articular cartilage, which is radiolucent. And the articular cartilage varies in thickness depending on the joint. For example, the knee joint uh, joint space is about six millimeters. So you look for the shape of the joint and you look for the congruency of the bone ends of the joint and you look if there is narrowing or asymmetry of the joint. Narrowing and asymmetry occurs in joint infection, in inflammatory arthropathies and osteoarthritis. And you look for erosions also of the bone ends, which occur in arthropathies. So again, you look for the shape, the congruency, and you look if there is narrowing or asymmetry and for the erosions. And you also look at the subchondral bone. It might be sclerosed or there might be radiolucent bone cysts and both the subchondral sclerosis and the radio bone, radiolucent bone cysts are, uh, are present in the osteoarthritis disease. And you look at the joint margin looking for osteophytes, which are bone spurs and those also uh, are manifestation of osteoarthritis. So here we have examples of the shoulder joint. So the left picture here is a normal shoulder joint. As you can see, the joint, uh, the articular surfaces are well opposed and the joint space is symmetrical uh, along the joint. So the humerus and the glenoid are well opposed, they are congruent, the joint space is normal, so this is a normal shoulder joint. On the right picture here, as we can see that uh, the articular surface of the uh, humerus here and the glenoid here, so this is like uh, an, a dislocated shoulder joint, and this is the AP view of the shoulder joint, and here we have the lateral view and it also uh, shows that the joint here is uh, dislocated from the glenoid. Now here we have another example of the knee joint. Here we have the normal knee joint on the left. So as we can see that the joint space is symmetrical on both sides and uh, it is more than three millimeters because if it is less than three millimeters it's considered osteoarthritic uh, so yeah and there is no osteophytes there's no subchondral sclerosis on the right picture here we can see that the joint space is decreased on this side and it is almost obliterated on this side uh, and there is subchondral sclerosis here and here and as we can see here that there is an osteophyte so this is all findings of osteoarthritis now after you uh, assess the bone and the joint, now you assess the soft tissue. So the soft tissue planes are often visible. On the x-ray, you look for any changes in the soft tissue. For example, the soft tissue mass, calcification, gas, in gas forming infection, foreign body, swelling of the soft tissue around the interphalangeal joints suggest rheumatoid arthritis. So here we have an example of soft tissue on an x-ray. So uh, this picture on the left is for the dorsal plantar projection of the foot. And if you focus on the soft tissue around the first tar metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint, just focus on that and focus on the soft tissue on this x-ray of a patient with uh, gouty arthritis of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. As you can see, the soft tissue around it is quite swollen. So this is an example of swelling of soft tissue. And this is another example. So uh, this patient has an infection of their femoral bone, on the right femoral bone. And if you notice that the, the left one is normal, the left femoral bone is normal, and as you can see, this is the soft tissue. This is the uh, 
limits of the soft tissue here on the right uh, but on the left as you can see the soft tissue is much bigger so it shows swelling so now let's talk about the fracture description this is very important because you are going to translate whatever you understood from the x-ray to other people other team members so it is important to learn how to describe fractures so you can communicate your findings with other team members and with your seniors and you start by mentioning the patient name age and presentation and after that you mention the shape of the fracture is it transverse spiral oblique commuted or segmental and then you mention the fracture location you describe it according to the location of the bone on the bone uh, long bone head neck shaft or condyle or you can use the epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis an example would be there is a fracture in the distal metaphysis of the femur or there is a fracture in the inferior third of the shaft of the femur and finally you mentioned displacement so you describe the displacement of the distal fragment in relation with the proximal one and we have four patterns of displacement we have translation shift angulation tilt rotation shortening lengthening and depression and all of those are explained in one of the videos in this playlist uh, titled as fracture displacement patterns and you also mentioned the direction of the displacement is it anterior displacement for example anterior angulation uh, is it posterior is it medial is it lateral and if it if it is not displaced you say without displacement now let's talk about the rule of twos in trauma x-ray this is commonly used in trauma so you have to know about it so the rule of twos is that we have two views of the x-ray you take an AP view and your posterior view and lateral view give you a better definition of the pathology and you take two joints in the x-ray so your the x-ray film should include two joints the joint above and the injury and the joint below the fracture must be included in the x-ray because the bone that is fractured may be associated with a dislocated joint or another fracture somewhere else on the bone and two limbs the x-ray of the injured limb can be used for comparison used in children because the immature epiphysis make it hard to diagnose the fractures and two injuries because in high energy injuries there is more than one fracture for example if there is a femur fracture then you expect a pelvic fracture or a spine fracture associated with it and finally two occasions meaning you take x-ray on multiple occasions after the injury time because some fracture is difficult to detect immediately after the injury but they become clear after a week or two of the injury for example the scaphoid fracture the femoral neck fracture and the stress fracture and with that we reach the end of this video thank you guys for watching please make sure to like and subscribe and if you want to support more you can by subscribing to the patreon link provided in the description of this page thank you for watching peace